Thank you for downloading this podcast from Emmanuel Church Lurgan. At Emmanuel, our vision is to help rewrite the story of Craigavon, Ireland and the nations with the good news of the Kingdom of God. We hope you enjoy listening to this message. I suppose just to remind ourselves of the reason why we were, are pressing and that it's just for four Sundays. Uh, it's purely out of a place of worship. It's, it's what we've just been doing this morning as we come and we bring our praises to God, as we behold Him and we see who He is and we magnify Him. It's similar even in terms of what we're doing, even with these life rhythms, as we behold Jesus. We're just saying that we recognize we want to see who He is, but who He's also called us to be. And, uh, and I suppose out of a place of worship and our devotion to God, this is the reason why we're doing this. It's not a religious thing. We're doing this purely out of a place of relationship. Phil read this verse, um, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, but we've read it so many times over the last few years, and I love it, Eugene Peterson's uh, wording of it in Romans chapter 8 simply says this, God knew what he was doing from the very beginning. He decided from the outset to shape the lives of those who love him along the same lines as the life of his son. The son stands first in the line of humanity he restored. We see the original and intended shape of our lives there. And I love that last line. We see the original and intended shape of our lives there in him. We see in Jesus what our life was always purposed to be, what humanity was always purposed to be as it was created in the very beginning. And so what we're simply saying, there's an invitation for us right now in this moment as part of our salvation, in terms of what it is to be a believer, there's an invitation for us to step into that original intended shape. That's pretty cool, isn't it? That we get to try and experience and to hold on to that. But simply all we're saying, and the reason why we're doing this series in Life Rhythms, we're recognizing that in order to do that, it just doesn't happen. But in order to do that, there has to be an intentionality. There has to be a purpose. There has to be a reason that we would actually want to put behind it of how we live and experience this life that God calls us into. It's almost like what we're recognizing there has to be, if, if we're saying that this is what we want, if we're saying we want to grow to become more and more and more like Jesus, if this is the goal, we're asking what are the things we're putting in place that's helping us journey towards that? We're saying if this is, if this is what we want to get to, how are we starting? What are the steps that we're taking? If we want to become more and more like Jesus, what are some of the rhythms, perhaps even the ones that we see in his life, we need to ask ourselves, because truly this is utterly what it means to be a Christian. This is what it means to be a believer. It's much more than just simply saying that prayer. Yes, one day we will be with God in his fullness in heaven and the life to come, but this is the beautiful part of it, what it actually means to be a Christian. It's a decision of the heart right now to give ourselves to become like Jesus, more and more like Jesus right now. To live as closely to his example right now and to experience more and more of his fullness of life right now. We're going to experience it in the fullest way in heaven one day, but there's an invitation for us to step into more and more and more and more and more of that. And so that's the whole reason of it. Just before I press into today where we're going, just one of the passages, I suppose, around this for myself, even in reflection, we've been reading Luke's gospel over the past, uh, over the past mornings as part of the New Testament during the week. Um, Phil um, informed you last week that Luke chapter 6 was, um, was left out of the reading plan. I apologize for that. Um, but just before Luke chapter 6, the one that got away from us in Luke chapter 5, there was a part that really caught me myself when I was spending time in it. I just wanted to reflect on it just for a minute this morning, suppose just to lead us where we're going. Luke chapter 5 opens with these words. One day, as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him. And listened to the word of God. And that, that morning, as, as I sat with my journalist, was spending time with God, what I started to just question in myself was just asking, what are the ways in which I, like if, when I was looking at the people in the crowd, I was asking myself this question, what are the ways in which I am intentionally pressing in to hear the word of the Lord for me? What are the ways in which for me as the son of the father and believing that the father wants to speak to me, what are some of the ways that I am intentionally pressing in and positioning and shaping my life so that I, I can actually hear the Father speak to me. We see that Jesus had some key discipline rhythms in his life. And so I'm just asking myself, what do those look like for me? That's part of why we're doing this. And so Luke chapter 5 begins with this, the crowd pressing in. 
looking to hear more of God. And then it finishes in Luke chapter 5 with this dialogue all around fasting. Jesus is getting questions all over the place around, why are your disciples not fasting and John's disciples are fasting? And Jesus is giving this understanding about because the bridegroom's there and one day he'll not be and then they'll fast. And it started to just get my attention because this has been one of the key rhythms for me over the past year. It's been around the area just of fasting. But in this what Jesus starts to bring out of it, he starts to go into another part. I mean, you'll read this in Luke chapter 5 for yourself. There's another part that he starts to press it all around fasting. It's still where he's answering the question about fasting. He starts to talk about new wine, new wineskins. He starts to talk about the old rag or the old cloths and the new cloths, the, the old wineskins and the new wineskins and the new wine. And he st- this is all embedded within the conversation to do with fasting. And what it started to come up to me and I started to recognize this is that there was, there was a need for us if we want the new wine, which we really, truly desire in our lives, then there has to be an intention. Jesus is looking this to do with the rhythm. It's all around fasting. But what really caught me the most, Luke chapter 5 finishes with this one line. And it simply says this, but no one who drinks the old wine seems to want the new wine. The old is just fine, they say. When I read that, I I really sat up. I felt like the Lord really starting to just question stuff in my own heart. Jesus says this, but no one who drinks the old wine seems to even want the new wine. The old is just fine. They say, we've all, we're all coming from different journeys and different points. We look back at our own journey and walk with the Lord. We've all got different moments of places we've come from and even where we're at now. But sometimes in our heart, what could so easily happen is we get to this point where we just almost look at ourselves and we think, you know, what we've had and what we've experienced, it's just fine. It's enough. <laughs> we're okay. The way things have always been done, the way things have always been, the way what God has maybe spoken to you in the past, you're almost you're satisfied with, that's enough. It's just fine. Even, I would say, and this is the reason why we're doing these rhythms, the intentionality of for you to hear the Lord for yourself, because sometimes you can almost get to this place, you know, with the secondhand information which we can glean from other people's encounters with the Lord. That's just fine for me too. And yet what God has for each and every one of us is the personal experience. And so for me, this is what, Jesus, and this is what made me start to sit up. How are we intentionally pressing in to really experience that new wine? We want it, don't we? We can talk about that so much in charismatic circles. We want the new wine. We can sing about it. We believe in the new things of the Holy Spirit, but there has to be a purpose and a structure in our lives. That is the goal. And so that's the reason, let me just go past this quote, that's the reason why we went into this series is why we put this up over the last couple of weeks. That's why today you're going to be looking at this again. We're going to be asking you for yourself. We're not going to tell you what to do because that's the worst thing. When someone is trying to simply tell you what to do, it has to be a choice of the heart. God, this is what I want to do. This is what's important for me in my life. And so these key areas that you see in the screen, there were key aspects of Jesus' life, which he used and was framing around. We're saying we want to just try and look at and see is there things within them that which we can glean from, which we can embed in our own lives. And so last week, Phil began by looking at the first one of prayer and abiding and looking about how we intentionally spend time with the Lord. Phil shared this last week, his own one. I'm just going to put my own up briefly. I'm not going to talk through it too much. Well, all I want to say to you is, is this, that this week, our prayer and abiding and family relationships is one I'm doing this week. The two of those, this week in life group coming up, we're going to share those together. So if you're in a life group, what we're going to be simply doing in a life group is obviously we'll still get time just to hang out, teas and coffees, catch up all about Christmas and COVID and all that sort of thing, everything going on in people's lives. But we're going to just be simply sharing, being honest and vulnerable with one another. These were some of the rhythms could look like for me when we can share this and own this together. We bring it into the light and discuss it and help and support one another. We be the church together in those ways. We're doing that life group this week and then the next life group will be doing the next two of these. And so for me, this is last week when I was sitting at the end in those five, 10 minutes when I had my phone out, this is simply a copy and a paste from my phone, what I had written in last week, last Sunday. For me, I'd split it into for prayer and abiding. I'd looked at it daily, in terms of a daily, weekly, and monthly, how I was trying to focus in on this. One of the things before you read what I have there, I think it's really important. <laughs> Don't get religious about these things. We want to be intentional, but we want to be free and flexible to the Spirit's leading. 
We want to be open to how God is leading and guiding us in these things. Don't be religious and legalistic about these things. And so for me, these were some of the things that I would, I'm trying to shape my life around, but I want to be fluid and flexible enough to move with it. And so in the daily setting, all I'm simply saying is this for me in the mornings, just going to be reading along with the New Testaments. When I say the word meditating, it's not a Buddhist type thing. I'm simply saying I'm meditating on the scripture. I'm allowing it just to get alive inside of me. I want more time just to focus on what God's saying to me. And if I have space and time before the kids get up and everything hits the fan and everything goes mad, um, we're just simply saying I, I'm really enjoying just journaling this year. I, I've been rubbish at journaling over the years. Phil loves journaling. So obviously he lost his journal. It's on somewhere in Belfast down the motorway. Um, I've always been pretty bad at it, and this year I've been enjoying just trying to do it when I can get the space actually to be journal. In the afternoons, I'm trying to get time just to, to walk and to pray. I've got just a note on my phone, just different people I'm praying for. I'll own and be open. I didn't get any prayer walks this week because church life was just manic in the past week, but this is my intentionality of what I really want to try and do. And then in the evenings, I'm just trying to read along. So I'm trying to do the Bible in the year. I'm just reading the Old Testament. And then in the evenings, I'm just trying to leave periods just to be silent and still before God. Before I drift off to go to sleep, I want to be still before Him and practice silence. And then simply on a weekly basis, I'll talk more about these in the weeks to come, fasting again. I'm just trying to be disciplined around that. Sabbath is a key part for us as a family and what it means for us. And then on a monthly, bi-monthly, I'm just trying to look around how I'm intensely just trying to get space away on my own just for me and God for no one else in terms of solitude for me and God. And listen, I'm not talking that's a full 24-hour thing. It could be dropping the kids to school, going somewhere until I pick them up again, but it's just me and God. It's just time for me and him, nothing else, no distractions. That's part of my rhythm for it in terms of abiding. This week, what we're moving into, though, is around family relationships. And as we come into it, the key question we're asking in here and in Portadown across both churches for us to reflect on, and this is what we're asking you at the end, really to be thinking through is this. What core relationships do you need in this season of your life to support you on a journey into Christlikeness? You could also turn it around, suppose, and ask the question of what core relationships need you in this season to help help support them to journey into more of their Christlikeness? In terms of the people that you have in your life, and we're going to be focusing on this quite specifically, who do you need in your life to help you in the journey, to help you become more like Jesus but who else also are you helping in that way as well? As we begin to unpack this theme this morning, it's important to note um, that the friendship and family were a key part of Jesus' existence in his life, right? And when we unpack who Jesus really was, listen, I'm going to take about 10 minutes just around this, share a bit of my own thoughts and practices, and then leave space for you, right? So don't freak out when I put a word up on the next screen and think, how on earth is he going to talk in this in 10 minutes, right? But to get a true understanding of who Jesus really is and a true understanding about relationship, we have to have a true understanding of the doctrine of the Trinity, right? That's why I'm saying don't freak out because we could preach for months on the Trinity and a full understanding of this. In the most basic way and understanding of it, we just simply need to grasp this. God is Father, God is Son, and God is Holy Spirit. We see this as the image and the symbol that's used for Trinity. They're three distinct persons, but they're so united in love for one another that they are one. Often, I don't know about you, but often it can come in our minds when we think and we pray to God, we think of the Father, and often we have this Jesus and the Holy Spirit aloof and sitting separate. And while they're three distinct persons, they're so deeply united in one. God is one. God is a relational being. God is family. God is community. It's who he is. And he can't be anything else other than this because it's who he is. And so when we know that, it's no surprise that even as we read the biblical narrative, we've an understanding that that's how God engages and it's almost what he wanted. Even as he created humanity, we see God wanting to be in relationship We see God walking in the cool of the day with Adam and Eve when everything goes wrong and we suddenly see that actually as sin comes into the world, God's heart doesn't change. He's still acting and operating out of the place of who he is. He cannot be anything else other than who he is. And so he desires relationship and family and community. And so he calls himself a man called Abraham. And he promises him and commits to him. He says that he will make him a mighty nation. And through him, he would form for himself a family. Through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob becomes Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel. Through them, they become a family. Even when we read in their years in the wilderness, as God comes and presences himself 
in the tabernacle. He's operating out of the place of who he is. God is relationship. God is family. God is community. He is a relational being. And so it also helps us to understand then the part of us which is born for friendship. It's born for relationship because when we read the in Genesis, how we're made in the image of God, we need to recognize this. We are created in the image of a relational God. This is who God is. And so there's a part of us that deeply needs this. And so out of the fullness of who he is, we need to recognize that Jesus highly valued relationships. Even when we look at the life of Jesus, when you look at it in the Gospels, it was much more than just something that he was doing out of a pure, because he had to, or in a transactional sort of way. He loved friendship. He loved people. He loved relationships. Even with his disciples. So disciples were, were, were common enough. There, was, uh, there were other rabbis in the times of Jesus. Other rabbis who would have called for themselves disciples, but it was purely a functional thing. Rabbis had a, disciples were known, I think the Hebrew word is telmedim, but it was a purely functional thing. It was more even the rabbi trying to get something more out of it himself in this. It was a prestige thing as well. And so people could maybe have seen Jesus and his disciples in that light. Maybe even for the disciples themselves, they might often have thought, what does Jesus really think about us in that way? And yet Jesus almost nails it in John chapter 15 when he says this to his disciples, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. It's beautiful, isn't it? Jesus comes to say, you're my friends. This means so much to me. You mean so much to me as my friends. Jesus had come with a mission and a purpose for the world, but he'd come to do it in partnership with others. He'd come to restore that. It's sometimes, it's sometimes crazy to get your head around, isn't it? Because I mean, purely, I hear people say this all the time. Surely God could have done it on his own. Like sometimes when we even talk about that theology about how he created mankind in his own image because that's how he always wanted to work through in relationship and delegated authority. I hear people say this all the time, but surely he could have just done it on his own. And he could have. But again, if he did, he wouldn't have been true and operating, operating truly out of the heart of who he is. God is relationship. In terms of when we look at the Trinity, God is relationship. And so when we see Jesus, Jesus even at this place, when he operates with the disciples, he's operating out of the part of who he was. Al said this line to me during the week, and I loved it, so it's up on the screen. I'm just, this is his, this is his line, right in case there's plagiarism. Lanny's going to pour it down off the back of this. You'll probably hear this when you go over there. Um, his method for ministry was relationship with the Father and relationship with his friends. I love that. His, his method for ministry was relationship with the Father, which we've looked at last week in terms of abiding, and relationship with his friends. For me, the incredible truth, and I say all of that simply to point out this, family, friendship, relationship in the correct context is such a holy thing. Family, friendship, relationship in the correct context is such a holy thing. It's such a sacred thing. Sometimes we think that we have it compartmentalized. We have our God stuff over here, and then we have our things with our family and our friends. But family, friendship, relationship, when it's done in the right context, is such a holy thing. It's when God comes into this and we bring it into our relationship with God. It's such a holy thing. And listen, we've all got different types of relationships with different types of friends, different relational spaces. But friendship and relationship for, it is, for us is key. So think of it in this way. You have, even in your own life, you might have your spouse, your husband, your wife. Think of your parents, your grandparents, you have children, brothers, sisters, you have friends, you have work colleagues. There's so many different, different relational orbits that you could think about people in your own life. And if you can think of people in some of those contexts, this morning I simply want to say this, give thanks to God that you have some people in those ways. We think about it as well, even in terms of a church family, many of the relationship types that I've just mentioned, might, you might even find that they're embedded here within church. But you know what? There's probably loads of people here in this room this morning that you don't know. If you look around the room, there's probably so many people that you don't know their names. You don't know who they are. 
And yet, what we need to recognize is that within the church family, we have a significant relational connection and contribution to make to one another because this is God's family. And if we're going to be the family of God, then we need to flow out of the heart of who God is and God is relationship, God is family, and this is how we want to help and support one another. We can't be all things to all people, but yet there's a role that we play into this who we are as the church. And so that's the essence of what I really want to just frame this morning is relationship is key. Everything that we're about to put up in terms of relationship and how we are People are sowing into our lives to help us grow to become more like God. How we're doing that for other people, it's key. We can't sidestep it. This is a key part of our walk and our relationship with Jesus. It's much more than just simply having mates. Having mates is brilliant. But when we have an intentionality, it's like we have mates because we want to do life with them. We want to nurture. We want to support. We want to grow with them. We want to help them. We need their help as well. That is important. Just two or three truths just to say before I just share my own rhythms this morning and then leave space for you guys just to to take time yourselves. Firstly, I want to say this. Isolation is a tactic of the enemy. Isolation is a tactic of the enemy. He knows that if he can get us alone, it plays right into his hands. I'm sure you've watched those nature programs where um, the lions, the pride of lions, go after like the, I don't know, zebras or wilderbeast or something like that and you notice like when one of them ends up getting detached from the rest so when you see the zebras all running up and one of them gets detached suddenly that's when the lions have got him and it's the tactics of spiritual warfare as well the enemy knows that if he can isolate us and get us alone it plays right into his hands I recognize, though, that with that, there are many different personality types, even as I look around the room this morning, extroverts, introverts, those that are quiet, those that are loud, and they're all fine, they're all natural part of who we are. But it's never been an excuse for isolation. There's loads of people who would say that they just love their own space, and that's fine. You love being on your own at times to get a bit of your own space and a bit of your own headspace, that's fine. There's a difference between wanting your own space and being comfortable with being in isolation. Because <laughs> isolation is the tactic of the enemy. And this morning, this is why I just wanted to frame it at the beginning and need us to recognize the significance that relationship is key. It's part of who God is and what he calls us into. In fact, we even see it in the opening pages of Scripture. In Genesis, we see the heart of God where he says this, it's not good for man to be alone. Loneliness is not, uh, is not what God would be about. It's not the way he's supposed it to be. And even we see the psalmist in Psalm 68 verse 6 say this, God sets the lonely in families. It's God's heart to connect us in relationships. And so for whatever relationships you have again in your life and whatever it is, let's give thanks to God for it. In terms of applying this, and so for answering that question that I put up at the start, we're asking about what are the key relationships in our lives. Again, if we look at Jesus and we look at his example, it's important to see how he framed his time. And this is, even for me, as I prepared for this this week, man, I'm recognizing just the the challenge of it myself because I'm I'm writing it and I'm thinking, I can be so hypocritical as I say some of these things. And what I'm saying is that I'm the same as you. I'm saying that this year I want to be intentional to try to press into these things. I'm not saying I get these perfect But I'm saying that I want to be intentional this year to press into it. As we see in the life of Jesus, Jesus was perfect and beyond what any of us could ever attain to be in in perfection. But we need to remember that Jesus humbled himself and took on flesh and took on humanity. And in humanity, he took on our limits. Jesus, who was God, and Jesus, who was God in all times, from before he took on flesh and was omnipotent and was, was all present, Jesus came on and took on the limitations of humanity. He was one man. He was bound to one place at one time. He couldn't be everywhere at once. And so therefore, he couldn't be everyone's friend. <laughs> Jesus had to be specific with his time. He had to be intentional with his time. And if Jesus had to do that, how much more do we? <laughs> And so what I see in the life of Jesus, we've referenced this sometimes in our discipleship context previously when we've been talking about life groups. Sometimes in the scriptures, we see these rhythms in Jesus' life. He had his family. He had three, Peter, James, and John. He had his 12 disciples. He had 72 and more. And he had those on the outside of the kingdom, those that were on the margins. We read about how he he ate with tax collectors and sinners. Let me just briefly just say one or two things in those, share my thoughts, and then leave space for you guys. 
Obviously, in terms of family, we should be able to commit to our families. It's important that we give time to our families. It's also important that we recognize that our families don't restrict us from our devotion to God as well. It's important in this that there's a balance, but we need to recognize that giving of ourselves to our family, parents, it is your responsibility for your children. It is my responsibility for my children in terms of nurturing them and bringing them up in the ways of the Lord. This is in our watch. For your family that you have around you, this is a key part and an aspect of who we are. Jesus had three, his close friends, as I said, Peter, James, and John. He could ultimately be himself with. He could, he, these are the people that got the majority of his time. Think to yourself, who are those people in your life? The ones you could just be yourself with. Got the majority of, who could get the majority of your time. Jesus had the 12, the wider group, all their close friends, but maybe just weren't, maybe more just in the center of things. He had 72, another wider community space, different groups of people. And even, for example, Jesus went to a synagogue, like he came to church like us. In terms of relational connections, Jesus knew what it was to turn up, not on a Sunday, but on a Saturday, like this. And Jesus also prioritized those on the margins. Like, imagine what it was where he was able to call people, you know, come down because I'm coming to your house for tea. What it was intentionally just to make space. For me, practically, just in two minutes, here's my thoughts in terms of what I want that to be for me this year. And listen, when I say this, I'm not saying that these are all in place right now, but I'm saying this even from a place of vulnerability and accountability. I'm going to be talking about this this week with my life group. I want to be able to own this and be transparent about it. These are some of the things I want to press in. So for me, in terms of growing into these in my life, firstly, even around, as I look at that list, firstly, around family, I want quality time with my wife. I want quality time with her. I don't know about you, but sometimes I just feel like, even with COVID and being in lockdown, all the time just seems to blur into one. <laughs> Do you notice that? It just seems to blur into one. And in terms of intentionality of quality time, being able to engage and to talk and to hear one another, I recognize that you, just, you need to set time aside properly for that, otherwise it just doesn't happen. I remember when I first started in the church, Phil looking at my diary and saying my diary was ridiculous because I didn't have any of these things in. And he was saying, if you don't have it in, it just won't happen. Specific time with the kids, diarized time with them. So that's like things like going to their sports with them, their music, time with them individually, time together. Again, if I don't intentionally put it in, it won't happen. Time with my parents, time with my sisters. I want to say everything in this bracket, simply to say this, as I reflect over the past year or two, I recognize that with busyness of life, everything that's going on with COVID, a busyness of life, Busyness just of work and my ministry, I recognize that my family and my closest friends are the ones who can get the scraps. Do you ever notice that in your life? Your family and your closest friends can be the one that get the scraps of your life. And yet these are the ones that are important. God is position. And for me, this is why I'm asking, right, how can I intentionally do it? For friends, meals, coffee with friends, time to talk with friends. I'm saying this, this one, um, in terms of friends, I, this is why I'm saying I need to be vulnerable. Even over Christmas, I've been talking about my friends quite a bit with Laura, and I've been recognizing that I just sometimes am not the best of friend because I give myself so much to work that I don't give my yes to my friends. And, and one of the people I was talking about over Christmas was Maggie, and I see Maggie here in church this morning. And even though I was writing to this, I was thinking of Maggie. And, and I just want to say this. I, Mike, I'm sorry for the time I haven't given you. And I want to be intentional for that. You're one of my best mates. And yet I recognize that we need to be intentional with the people that are important. The people that are important. And I've been chatting with Laura, you know, as much as my vulnerabilities all play into it, we just need to be important. So how are you pressing into it? Meals, coffees with friends, time to pray with friends, and then church, all the relationships, so life groups, weekly church gatherings, they're all going into my diary. Time, listen, and when it comes to relationship, and time for other non-Christian friends' context. Let me just say one thing in that. I recognize that working in church means that sometimes I can live in a bubble. And sometimes you're not in and around loads. Like when I worked in school, you were around lots of non-Christians. And yet for me, it's trying to be intentional with the environments that you're in. And so I, even there's a coffee shop I go to quite regularly. I've tried to get to know the names of all the waitresses and waiters. I've got to know the owners. I've got to know bits and pieces about their lives. They know that I'm praying for them. I send them prayer requests. 
prayers to them as well. It's just important about how we're being intentional to shape us. And so I'm asking, how do I get all of these into my diary? What we'd need to say with this, by the way, in another two weeks when we fill this all up, we're going to be giving you the full quadrant. It's important that with all that we have, we need to be able to position and shape this in a way that works for us, that's sustainable and that's manageable, that's attainable for us to press into. But in all of this, what we're simply going to do for the last five minutes, we're just going to give you space to work this out for yourself. And so we're putting the, the quadrant up again. The guys, I would love you to take out your phone. I took my notes on my phone last week. I just went to the notes section. I just simply would love for you to work this out for yourself, for the friendships in your life. Think about those things. Lucy's going to come and play some quiet, relaxing music for us on the keys as we do this. But for you in your life and the intentionality of family and friends, and even thinking around that family, Jesus and his life with the three, with the 12, with the 72, with the wider group, with those that were on the margins, those that didn't even know Jesus yet, your non-Christian people in your life, contacts that you have, how are we being intentional about time? What does it actually look like in the space in this season for it? And so for these next few minutes, I would just love for you to craft it for you. I've shown you what it is for me, what I'm hoping it can be. I, I need to stay in that, but this is a decision of the heart for me, and this is what I want to pray and commit to the Lord in this season. So a few minutes for yourselves is what we did last week. If you prefer to do this on a paper copy, if you have a pen, you can put your hand up. The guys have some of these at the back as well. If you keep your hand up, they'll bring you a paper copy. It was handy for me taking it on my notes last week on my phone, to be honest. But if you want paper, put your hand up and the guys have some here, if you want one. Everyone's comfortable on phones. We're a very modern church. Allow God to just speak to you in this moment and just to lead you personally. You know the people, you know the in your life. And start to just try and work out what is it for you in this season? What are some of the things that you sense God's calling you to? So just a few minutes and then I'll pray at the end just as we finish. We hope you enjoyed listening to this podcast. For more information about our church and all that we do, please visit our website at emmanuel-church.co.uk.